OK, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining our first uh, Big Data Project technical webinar. Um, it's the uh, first in a series of uh, eight, which we will have through the next two and last two years of the project. Um, the point of today's um, presentations is to give a bit of an overview um, of um, the pr project's technological uh, contributions, current developments, and also uh, plans for the pilots. Um, we had a lot of uh, workshops, um, both physical and also online hangouts, uh, related to the specific societal challenges. And the purpose of today's um, webinar is to um, have a bit more information about the technical components and the architecture uh, being developed by the project and how these will be applied uh, within the seven pilots for each of the seven societal challenges which you can see here. So health, food and agriculture, energy, transport, um, climate, social sciences and security. Um, and yeah, the objectives of the project are to uh, lower the barrier for the reuse of the big data technologies, um, being fully aware that uh, one of the um, challenges uh, limiting the potential of big data applications is the lack of skills, data science skills. So yeah, the project likes to lower the barrier by uh, providing um, ready-to-use technology which can be applied uh, to several use cases uh, with little or reduced uh, technical expertise. So um, and yeah, through the data value chains, we want to um, improve the data value chains and also enable cross-domain uh, um, applications of big data through our technological um, contributions. So um, just some more information about the project for those who are not very uh, accustomed to the project. It's a, a coordination support action, H2020. So there's two main um, aspects. There's the coordination, which is uh, the building of communities centered around the seven societal challenges. Um, and through the interaction with these stakeholders, we, we um, elicit the requirements. Um, these requirements will then go on to the support part, which you can see on the right hand side. And the result from the requirement facilitation is to design, realize, and evaluate a big data aggregator architecture components, basically a platform, which uh, its result would be the cloud deployment uh, version of a big data aggregator platform that can um, be customized for uh, different uh, domains and use cases. Um, the consortium of the projects um, is composed of uh, 16 partners. So, sorry. Um, yeah, 16 partners, and uh, nine of these uh, are jointly or individually uh, covering the seven societal challenges. So, they're basically domain experts. And uh, the rest of the partners. Um, are uh, technical support uh, or have other roles in the project. Um, basically, there's the 16, which you can see here in this slide. Um, yeah, and uh, Fraunhofer, on whom, on behalf of on which I'm presenting today, we're coordinating the project. Um, the activities with the stakeholders, there's an iteration uh, for all com composed of these steps. Um, at, the, at this moment, uh, we're at the first iteration, we have collected requirements from the communities and stakeholders we have engaged with. Um, and we're developing a generic platform, um, which we will now evaluate. And um, through also the instantiation in the seven pilots, uh, there will be more information about those today in the presentations. Uh, from a work package point of view, uh, you can see that in the second year, which we have now started in January, the focus is uh, a bit more on the uh, architecture development, um, the instances of these big data um, pilots, and also their evaluation. And then again, we'll have a rerun of the iteration. We'll get more requirements from the different communities to uh, further improve our uh, instance, generic instance, and also the pilots' uh, instantiations. So from a big picture of what the project is trying to achieve, the objectives is to have lots of data, big data, um, to provide methods for uh, compiling, um, harmonizing, or mapping data from different heter heterogeneous sources, um, to also interlink, semantify, um, and centralize access as much as possible in order to 
through the big directory architecture and the components, uh, most of which are existing. So we'll just bundle them up in an um, innovative new architecture, um, which can be customized uh, to analyze, discover, and visualize uh, data. And the end target is to have this for the different seven societal challenges, which you can see there on the left bottom, um, but also cross uh, domain. So some use cases will, for example, affect both climate and energy, or energy and transport, and so on. So the agenda for the rest of the presentation, mine was just a short introduction. Um, we'll have Timea, uh, who will introduce the results of the requirements solicitation phase. Then we'll have Erika, who will uh, introduce the architecture uh, of the Big Data platform. Then we'll have uh, Stasinos, who will describe the in a generic uh, BDE platform instance. And finally, we'll have Ronald, uh, who will we'll give an overview of the pilots that are being, um, that are in progress. Uh, the instance is basically of the generic instance. And we'll finish off with a question and answer session. Um, as uh, was communicated in the email, if you are following on the BDE website or on YouTube, you need to go to the Google Plus um, event page, where you will see this. Um, view here, you can add your questions there, and at the end we will uh, answer your questions. So that's all from my side. Um, without wasting more time, I would like to then go on to the next uh, presentation by Timea. Hello, everybody. My name is Timea Turdian, representing Semant Semantic Web Company, and one of our roles in uh, the Big Data Euro project was to do the requirements elicitation. Um, so uh, I want to tell you a bit about the process. Uh, last year, the requirement elicitation uh, kicked off um, with on an online survey to which we got uh, around 394 answers, uh, 88 interviews, uh, and we moved into uh, workshops for each societal challenge. So we had seven societal uh, challenge workshops. And of course, the use case pilots, uh, again, each uh, one for each uh, societal challenge. Whereas, um, uh, the requirement elicitation included uh, four use case, uh, use case pilots at the moment. And um, as you might know, along the big data uh, topic, uh, there's the mention of the four Vs, volume, velocity, variety, and varian, uh, veracity. So what we discovered uh, uh, for each V, uh, is that, for instance, the most help in the direction uh, for volume perspective is needed by Societal Challenge 1 and Societal Challenge 5. Still, it remains an important aspect uh, for other societal challenges as well. And, for instance, velocity. Uh, it, uh, in the process, it became clear that velocity needs to be addressed from three levels, from the data acquisition perspective, from the data processing, and the data display level. So um, each societal challenge has a different uh, perspective. Where is the velocity actually more important in which part of the um, process? when we talk about data. And uh, variety, it is an important concern for most societal challenges and the common feeling is that better integration solution of wider variety of data can lead to better statistics and in the end better decisions. Whereas veracity, uh, the, de the decisions that need to be taken based on the data we have can be as uh, they can be only as good as the data quality itself. So it is an important topic nevertheless. And this brings us uh, also to the next step in the requirements elicitation. We tried to look um, from the data value chain perspective 
on uh, the inputs we gathered from the surveys, interviews, workshops, and uh, pilot use cases. And even though it might look complicated, why you, what you need to notice in this picture is the fact that um, the, there are no very prominent common requirements that uh, one could say can be identified or clustered over all societal challenges. Uh, it's um, rather a more specific uh, approach for each societal challenge. So then we had to think about, okay, how can we look at the requirements uh, in another way? So we looked more at the functional requirements uh, themselves and tried to cluster them in functional blocks. So uh, we started talking uh, in the last requirement solicitation deliverable about these functional blocks, which will be reflected in components. And these components are prepared in the work package 4, are uh, specific to the pilots, uh, some of them are already available, these components, and some uh, will be developed in uh, the actual development of the pilot use cases. So let's take a look at some of the functional blocks that we found uh, in our requirements elicitation. And we go again around, uh, along the data value chain. So from the data acquisition perspective, for instance, we identified the need of having a component which deals with real data, uh, real tra time traffic data ingestion, for instance, or a component um, that helps a data set uh, being aligned and linked already at the ingestion time. And further on, from the data analysis perspective, uh, we, uh, we can cluster a bit the functional components based on the type of the data we are talking about. So for instance, um, if there's a need uh, or there's the news multimedia data, then there's a need for, uh, example, a component that deals with pattern recognition algorithms or from web data, a uh, component which deals with event detection over uh, text, or signal processing for sensor data. And it goes on. Uh, also, uh, what should be the results of the analyzed data? So for instance, a component which deals with complex um, agriculture and environmental modeling, uh, traffic flow prediction, power production prognostics, text annotation, uh, up to the point of um, a component that can integrate statistical tools like uh, MATLAB, for instance. And from the data curation perspective, as I mentioned before, variance being uh, something uh, important and in common for more societal challenges. When we talk about variance, we are talking um, more concrete about components which measure the quality of the information and of the data which is being processed, or a component which uh, can track provenance uh, during the chain of execution. And uh, uh, last but not least, data storage, there is the need uh, for components that can store a set of geolocated areas, uh, again, the provenance of the data or data in RDF format itself. And from the data usage perspective, um, and this is coming again from uh, the pilot use cases, also from interviews, um, after the data has been processed, uh, you need to make it available to your users, to the people who also make decisions based on this data. Uh, so there's a need for components that um, offer a logging functionality over the whole process for a better debugging of the process itself, uh, monitoring units, um, the ability to incorporate third-party systems, for instance. Then uh, there was the discovery of having um, GUIs and interfaces that um, uh, view results on a map, for instance. Um, also a need to aggregate data and make it uh, publicly available 
two APIs, for instance, in different formats like JSON or RDF, and also present, for instance, the results in a dashboard kind of uh, user interface, or um, have a component that can facilitate search over your data. And this being said, this was a very general presentation um, uh, that is, um, we go into detail in the deliverables itself if you're interested to take a look more specific for your societal challenge, for instance. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Timea. We will now go to the next presentation by uh, Erika. So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Erika from Tenforce. We're mainly involved in uh, the architectural design of the BDE platform and the implementation of the general platform. So, that's what I will present to you today. Um, when we started uh, on the, the architectural design of the platform, uh, we had two main targets in mind. The first one being that the platform should be uh, easy to use. As Simon already mentioned, uh, we want to lower the barrier for users to start using big data technologies. So we want to build a platform that is uh, as easy to use as possible, and it needs to be that in all aspects, so ranging from setup over development, deployment uh, to monitoring. A second target is that the plat platform needs to be flexible. I think you may all have seen a picture like this. Uh, it reflects the big data landscape as it is nowadays. There are a lot of technologies available. Uh, it's very difficult to predict the future. Uh, for example, if you do, did big data a couple of years ago, then you would probably pick uh, Hadoop MapReduce. Uh, then Spark arrived. A lot of people switched to Spark. And then since a year or so, Flink is getting a lot of traction. So we don't know what the future will bring. Uh, we, will want, we want to keep our options open and be flexible uh, for the future. What do we want to do with the platform? We want to run applications on top of it um, in the BDE project that will be in the form of pilot cases that will be implemented. Um, in our view, uh, an application is a combination of components that uh, communicate with each other in order to solve a particular um, uh, data problem. So, for example, you can have a Spark MapReduce algorithm, let's say uh, a word count uh, to keep it simple. Then you might need uh, an HDFS cluster uh, that consists of data nodes and name nodes um, to, to put your data on. You might need a Spark cluster with uh, a Spark master and multi multiple Spark workers to run your algorithm. And then you have the component that contains your actual algorithm that will execute the word count. So all those components together um, form a pipeline, form an application, that, and that's what we call a, a pipeline. So the first architectural design of our platform looks like this, where we have on top of the hardware uh, a kernel, uh, which is Mesos, that makes abstraction of the underlying hardware. On top of Mesos, there are, the, there are the frameworks available, uh, Docker Swarm, Marathon, and Kronos, that allow you to uh, deploy applications on the platform. Uh, all three frameworks uh, provide support for uh, Docker containers, and Marathon and Kronos also provide us with uh, native application installation. At first sight, uh, we thought that maybe not all big data technologies can be Dockerized, so with Marathon and Kronos, we have the ability to uh, install applications natively. But now if you look at it again, it seems that everything can be Dockerized, so in that view, Marathon and Kronos become a bit deprecated. Also, uh, the integration between Docker Swarm and Mesos is not yet production ready, and it seems that the com community is not moving fast enough there. Um, so we, made, uh, we simplified the architecture, and we have now just Swarm running on top of the hardware, and then we deploy all our applications uh, in Docker containers through Docker Swarm on the platform. Uh, maybe it's important to note that, in general, we try to follow the community very closely, and see how they move. Um, if we bump into problems that they didn't encounter or solve yet, then we try to, to um, find a solution ourselves. But even then, if at a later stage the com community comes with a solution, it might be that we still switch to that solution if it improves uh, our platform. Um, so in general, what I want to say is that we have an architecture now, but it's not written in stone. Um, if better or uh, more easy things come available, then we might still integrate them in our platform. 
If we go back to the idea that the platform should be as easy to use as possible for the user, then the first aspect is the setup of the platform. Uh, there we provide a manual uh, installation guide, which is documented on our GitHub repository, on the wiki there. The URL is on the slide. So that explains how you can install Docker Swarm on your cluster um, uh, with overlay networks uh, enabled. So that means that you can create networks that span multiple nodes in your cluster. We will also provide chef recipes. Uh, the ones that are available now on GitHub are a bit outdated. They don't reflect the latest architecture that we have, so we need, still need to update them. Once you have installed platform, how can you then uh, develop components uh, for the platform? And that's like I already mentioned a couple of times. We will, use, we will do that with Docker. So Docker, in a nutshell, you can compare uh, Docker containers to very lightweight virtual machines uh, in which you can install any technology or any application that you want. Uh, so by using Docker, we have the flexibility that we have in mind uh, because you can pick any technology. It doesn't necessarily have to be a big data technology that you can put in that container and then it can run on a platform. Uh, Docker containers are based on Docker images, which serve as kind of, of a template for um, the, the containers. And the idea of the Big Data project is to provide base Docker images for a selection of Big Data technologies. Um, a user can then simply extend that image with his own custom algorithm or data with a minimal effort uh, so that they can start using uh, the technology. That way, uh, we lower the barrier for users to start using uh, big data technologies because you don't have to know all the details about a particular technology before you can start using it. You can just extend the base image and you can start running. So then you have the building blocks uh, of, of your application. How do we glue them together then? That's where Docker Compose comes in. Uh, Docker Compose offers, offers us a way to describe in one file an entire pipeline, so you can specify which components, which Docker containers are part of your pipeline, um, how they are configured, and how they are wired together, how they can communicate with each other. So all the components that we will support are documented on uh, our wiki on GitHub, and they are also published on Docker Hub so that users can download them from there and start using them. So once you have your pipeline then, how can you deploy it on the platform? Well, that's just one single command, Docker Compose up. Okay, I must admit that the command line is maybe not that user friendly, not that easy to use. Um, we looked around and currently there seems that there is no graphical user interface available that serves our need. So we're looking into uh, building our own custom user interface that a, so that the user can very easily configure his pipeline and deploy it uh, on top of the platform. How is the deployment then actually done? That's through Docker Swarm. So Swarm um, puts all the nodes in your cluster in one Swarm that's then managed by a Swarm manager. You can send any Docker command to that Swarm manager and that will execute the command on your cluster in a transparent way to the user. So you can, for example, send the Docker Compose up command to the Swarm manager and then it will deploy your entire pipeline on the cluster. Uh, so it will automatically automatically download the images, install them, and start running uh, the containers. Then last but not least, there is the monitoring of the platform. Um, we didn't investigate a lot yet here. That's mainly future work. Uh, we will probably have a look at uh, technologies like Prometheus and uh, Grafana combined with InfluxDB. Uh, they are both based on C-Advisor so that uh, you can follow up the resource consumption of your cluster. Uh, for logging, we will have a look at the ELK stack, uh, standing for Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana, so that you get a unified view on your logs. Uh, also there, the Docker com community is working hard on uh, logging drivers for Docker containers, so we will closely follow that up and see whether it's useful or not for the VA platform. So that's it from my side. Thanks for your attention. Um, I suppose we continue with the next presentation and you can ask your questions at the end of the webinar. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, and the next uh, talk is by Stasinos. And yes, I would like to remind you again, if you want to ask questions, uh, you can add them again. Um, here, you can see on my screen uh, where you can do this. Uh, please add your questions. We'll answer them at the end. And uh, the next talk is by Stasinos. Um, so floor onto him. Uh, hello, everybody.
So uh, next, uh, next uh, uh, talk is about uh, an actual uh, how to deploy actual instances of the technologies that uh, Erica presented uh, in the previous talk, and how we how we are setting up uh, a cluster and uh, how we are going to provide uh, uh, these technologies for people to use and to specialize in their own needs. So, what we will call the integrator instance is uh, firstly a generic instance uh, of uh, the technologies that the BD is bringing together uh, with the objective of making it as easy as possible uh, and as automated as possible for people to make a deployment. And the project is uh, uh, selecting and testing and recommending particular infrastructure services for provisioning and clustering and deployment of uh, of the big data technologies and uh, preparing uh, docker uh, containers uh, that people can just download and, and deploy. And then uh, on top of this uh, generic instance, uh, the project will prepare uh, uh, dockers that uh, solve uh, particular uh, use cases that are the, the pilots of the, uh, that the project is using to test its, uh, its technologies. And, uh, this is going to be covered in more detail in the next talk, uh, the particular pilot selected. And what is relevant to, to right now is that uh, everything is uh, prepared as uh, extensions of uh, dockers, uh, so that it is easy to, to deploy uh, not only the general components, but also specific uh, components prepared for specific pilots. But uh, before getting there, uh, we are also preparing an extensive uh, manual and uh, chef recipes and uh, uh, manual in text uh, form on uh, how to prepare uh, the underlying physical nodes. Uh, in our uh, particular uh, deployment, uh, the, the nodes are in fact not physical, but uh, virtual machines executing on a, on a four-blade uh, uh, cluster. And we, we are following this approach basically for uh, security reasons to not provide access to the underlying physical machines and also to make it easy to switch uh, between different experiments, to switch between uh, different pilots by replacing the, the data images of the virtual machines. Uh, in case that uh, not all uh, experiments fit on the cluster simultaneously. But uh, for an actual production system, uh, it, the physical machines can also, the, the same instructions uh, can be applied to, directly to the physical machines. Uh, other decisions that, uh, about which the project is making recommendations uh, are with respect to which components to dockerize and which not to. Uh, one uh, one uh, component for which uh, uh, we are toying with the idea of not uh, deploying it via Docker is uh, the underlying storage, uh, such as HDFS, uh, although uh, this is still need to be tested uh, uh, as to whether there is an actual penalty uh, for uh, HDFS uh, uh, Docker, and if there isn't, or if it is negligible, then uh, uh, pretty much everything uh, will be provided in the, in the Docker container, as a Docker container. So, yeah, over this uh, basic infrastructure, uh, in the way that Erika already presented, uh, uh, Docker images are composed into uh, more and more specific uh, uh, components that solve more and more specific uh, problems, and then combined into pipelines uh, using uh, Docker Swarm. And this is another um, Another issue where the project is uh, assuming a position uh, between uh, selecting between uh, Docker Swarm and using Mesos to do the provisioning. Uh, we have experimented uh, with Mesos and with Docker Swarm, and the current uh, uh, the current thinking of uh, the consortium is to recommend uh, Docker Swarm, but uh, that remains to be seen, of course, after especially after uh, the pilots. So, uh, uh, as an example uh, deployment, uh, 
we have uh, prepared six uh, nodes, uh, four worker nodes, one uh, administrative master node that uh, executes all the all the master or head uh, uh, processes for the when uh, one is foreseen for the different uh, big data components, and the gateway uh, that is uh, the entry point to the infrastructure from the outside. So this is it. I guess any questions are deferred or uh, until after uh, Ronald's talk. Um, yeah, Ronald. Um, exactly. Please. Thank you, Stasinos, and uh, we move on to Ronald's presentation. Hello, everyone. Um, I am uh, Ronald Sibis. I'm from the VU University in Amsterdam, and um, we are affiliated with uh, the Open Facts Consortium uh, Foundation, uh, and now both the partners uh, uh, in this uh, Big Data Europe project. I'm going to give you an overview of the uh, Big Data uh, Europe uh, challenges, which are exactly those who are also part of the Horizon 220 uh, challenges, uh, challenges uh, uh, identified by the European Union. So <clears throat> there are seven societal challenges and for each of this challenge um, we have uh, we are going to do three uh, rounds of pilots and now I'm going to show you for every challenge the first pilot that we are planning to develop and evaluate. The first challenge is uh, life sciences and health. The partners uh, that are mainly uh, the main contributors to this uh, challenge and the pilot is the Open Facts Foundation. Uh, it's led by uh, Bryn Williams Jones and um, and myself from the VU University. The focus of uh, this challenge is large scale heterogeneous pharmaceutical research data linking and integration. So this is really the veracity, uh, sorry, the variety uh, aspect of having uh, a lot of heterogeneous data sets that are, have to be linked together in order to solve a solution. So it's really about data integration. Um, for pharma pharmaceutical research, uh, there are, um, we have already a lot of uh, knowledge and uh, data sets uh, being aligned and integrated. Some examples you can see below, it's from ChemSpider and Campbell Concept Wiki. These are all um, data sources being used by uh, researchers to do to develop new medicines. Um, so within within the project, uh, uh, the Open Facts project, we were able to align all these various um, data sets, uh, which means uh, that if you have an identifier for proteins from one uh, database, they might have some identifier and a number, and in another database, they might have another number. So in order to do integrated uh, queries, you have to align them, and everywhere you see an arrow, it means that they are aligned. So within OpenFacts, we developed um, an API to hide the complexity of the semantic web technology that we used. So we use RDF and Sparkle to, um, to answer the queries, but it is too much to ask from developers to learn the semantic web technology, we think. And also, writing good Sparkle queries is very difficult. Uh, with some simple mistakes, you can actually put an enormous load on the database. So we hide that complexity by adding an API layer, which is a REST interface where people can just um, uh, do uh, via HTTP GET some calls and you get um, JSON back or any other format that you desire. So the pilot is uh, duplicating this uh, the technology that was being developed within the Open Facts project uh, and now is part of the Open Facts Foundation. Um, and to duplicate the functionality, um, the reason to do that is um, uh, pharmaceutical researchers, they might want to have their technology in-house for security reasons, 
because their core uh, business is uh, being ahead of the competitors in some research. So they want to, don't want maybe don't want to take the risk that anybody can uh, sneak in and check what they are doing. Another uh, good reason is um, we want this the infrastructure and the technology that we de develop is not dependent on pharmaceutical research. You can also apply it to other domains, and we are planning within this uh, big data Europe infrastructure to a project to uh, align it with other. Um, domains, for example, um, the research on um, on wine uh, and grape uh, research. The next challenge uh, is food and agriculture. Here the partners are the FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and Semantic Web Company, Timea was already uh, talking before. Uh, the focus here is large-scale distributed agricultural data integration. Uh, this one, uh, this challenge and the pilot is very similar to the first one that I described because they also have the problem of uh, having various data sets from uh, all kinds of sources uh, in their own formats and they have their own identifiers so they have to be integrated and um, have to think of complicated um, uh, and integrated queries to answer real-life research questions. So the selected uh, data assets are all uh, 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 related to uh, agricultural research, as you can see uh, below. So the FAO, they uh, developed already an infrastructure uh, called Aginfra, um, where the, you have on the bottom all kinds of data sources uh, which are being made available in this AG infrastructure and then they have various services on top for example some uh, visualizations and other types of front ends. The focus of the pilots that we are going to develop is viticulture it's from the Latin word of vine um, it is a science and production and study of grapes so it deals with a series of events that occur in the wine yard so this is really for uh, researchers in uh, in the domain of viticulture. So the pilot, to summarize it, is support of advanced crop data discovery processing, combining a visualization from distributed and heterogeneous data repositories. The reason to do that is, uh, well, wine is an emerging market in the EU, and sustainability and biodiversity challenges are uh, that uh, local varieties being lost, and also the climate change uh, which is also an, another uh, challenge within our project, has an influence on which grapes can grow where. The big data infrastructure tasks is that uh, the large-scale data extraction is being done and integrated into um, uh, the ex uh, sorry integrated into the, um, the infrastructure. Um, the, for example, the RDF distributed RDF store uh, in order to answer uh, specific queries. Uh, I'm going a bit fast because I only have 10 minutes. Uh, questions can I will answer later. So now I'm on the energy um, societal challenge. Um, there the partners are uh, Cres and um, Democritos. Uh, so Stasinos, the previous speaker, is part of Democritos. Um, the focus area is real-time turbine, so a wind turbine monitoring stream processing and analysis. Uh, so there are all kinds of data assets in the energy domain uh, and the major one that we are using now for the first pilot is sensor data from uh, wind uh, turbines. So it's a big data stream of all kinds of sensor data that monitors the state of the turbines. So here you can see um, the turbine has all kinds of parts, and um, they are can all be uh, they are all being monitored because these are very expensive devices. And if you can see that some little part is going to fail, you can prevent that this uh, uh, further damage. In order to then you can just shut it down, replace that small component, and the windmill can just uh, continue its work. Um, so the pilot is, to summarize, operation, maintenance, and production forecasting for wind turbines on real-time sensor data. Um, 
Well, the reason that we have this pilot uh, on big, it is really a big data problem because the current technology is not able to deal with this enormous amount of sensor data. And if you can uh, predict, uh, make better predictions, you can save a lot of money uh, and also you can maybe predict um, the future output and therefore can maybe uh, balance uh, the, the alternative resources with the conventional resources. So therefore it's a pe perfect um, data set for our platform. Let's just skip to the next one. Uh, the other challenge, uh, societal challenge is transport, where we have Fraunhofer and CERT and Ertico. Um, this is about real-time monitoring, stream processing and analytics. So um, this is about if you can monitor various as experts of the, of the traffic, then you can, of course, um, uh, inform uh, the, uh, the 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 municipality or uh, also the the consumers, the drivers on the road, uh, that they can maybe take an alternative route. It will then be good for the climate. It will make people happier. Um, and also, um, it is uh, an economical uh, advantage if you can uh, stream the traffic better into the congested uh, cities. So in this pilot we have um, all kinds of sensor data uh, from, uh, from the roads. Um, so you can think of um, tracking Bluetooth, um, um, Mac IDs, I don't know if it's a Mac ID, but the Bluetooth have IDs and you can have sensors on the roads that can then just follow cars anonymously. Um, and then you can see how busy it is on the road and what kind of routes people take. So this is to give you a little insight on the data. Um, so you have also travel times from Bluetooth detectors, uh, there are cameras, uh, there are also other road sensors, and also there is a connection with social networks to, to see um, uh, which events uh, on the amount of check-ins, online check-ins, to see ah that spot will probably be very busy. Maybe we can uh, already take precautions that there will be no congestion uh, at that time. The fifth challenge is climate. Um, <clears throat> the focus area, big data focus area, is um, uh, that in climate uh, uh, we focus on climate research, which means um, large computational. Uh, intensive uh, models that predict various parameters uh, 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 and effects of, uh, of the climate uh, in the future. And it's extremely complicated and a perfect uh, in data intensive big data task. Uh, the pilot, the first pilot will focus on supporting cli data intensive climate uh, research. Um, and in climate research, you have uh, a lot of raw data. So you have these these algorithms that these models that uh, predict all kinds of parameters. But in order to um, uh, give answers, you have to uh, do research. You have to focus on certain parameters. So you have to downscale this huge raw data set into a perspective that is uh, you you are focusing focusing on. So you will have to take that large model and do computations on it in order to downscale it in for your specific parameters. And it's also computational intensive and therefore it's a big data problem. The sixth challenge, so sci social sciences. Um, so this is about statistical and research data linking and integration. Uh, here we focus on um, data, uh, census data and um, data from municipalities in order to uh, give insight to, uh, to the, uh, uh, the lawmakers but also the, the citizens to see what is going on in their municipalities and how is their money being spent. So the focus of this uh, pilot is citizens' budget spending on a municipal uh, level. Why do we do that? Well, the budget is the most important document of public policy 
and the budget execution affects everyday lives, the decisions which are being made. And citizens are also being more involved on a city level. So if you have a data platform that integrates this heterogeneous budget data, so many municipalities have their own data formats and streams, uh, and you can then calculate infographics that would benefit citizens, the research community, and policymakers. So the data that we have currently is a data stream from Greek municipalities, all uh, coded with unique identifiers that uh, say what kind of some kind of uh, uh, um, uh, class hierarchy where you can uh, categorize the types of spending. So it, it can be environment or it can be parking or housing, I don't know, all these kind of things. Uh, we have the data from three uh, big cities in Greece in very high detail uh, and it is updated several times in a day and we want to convert it into a daily uh, observations and integrate it into a, a large database where people then create queries that uh, gives this um, statistical information for uh, any kind of purpose. The last challenge is security. Um, there we have a partner, uh, the SATSEN. Uh, it's, it's the uh, center of um, uh, how do you call it? Uh, European Union Satellite Center, yes. And uh, they have access to uh, a very fancy uh, set of satellites and they just stream uh, large amounts of data, uh, data large, mo mostly image data. And we are going to use that data for security, uh, security in the broader sense of the word. Um, so the big data focus area is uh, large-scale uh, data image data analysis. And the first part pilot that we're going to develop is getting inside the man-made uh, service changes triggered by automatic detection uh, or uh, topics in the news or social media information. So here you can see, for example, um, a, a big uh, um, a stadium um, before and after the earthquake in uh, Nepal. So to summarize, pilot number seven is ingestion of remote sensing images and social sensing data to detect and verify man-made changes on the Earth for security applications. Uh, the reasons for this is if you know that uh, something is going on in some area, you can, for example, create evacuation routes. Or you can see if, some, um, uh, if it is close to some critical infrastructures that we have to monitor. Um, also recently, because of all the the big crisis in the refugees uh, situation, uh, border security might be um, part of the of the focus. Uh, satellite data is, as I said, is huge, and it's computational intensive to compare these images and to detect changes. So therefore, we have to find a smart focus algorithms that uh, that are needed to prioritize this 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 uh, image analysis jobs. And this focus is being determined, for example, by analyzing Twitter streams. If there's suddenly somewhere a lot of Twitter messages going on, then it is it might be useful to compare the satellite images a day before and after. Um, yes, that is uh, basically it. I think I spent my 10 minutes. So um, any questions, I'll answer uh, after the whole event. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ronald. Um, so that completes our presentations. We'll go now to the question and answer session. Uh, you still have a ch chance to um, ask your questions. Uh, they will show up live and we'll just go through them one by one now. So um, the first question um, is the following. Is the development process of Big Data Europe an open procedure, for example, via GitHub? and so on, so that possible stakeholders can get a chance for hands-on before the final release. Um, I think um, Erika can probably best answer that question. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, as I already mentioned in my presentation, um, things we're working on right now are already available on our GitHub, so people can follow there what we're doing. Um, our Docker containers will be tagged when they become uh, stable with versions, so you can see what's still work in progress and, and what is um, production ready, let's say.
Thank you very much, Erica, for that. So I hope that question is answered. The next question is the following. Um, mm -hmm. Will the technology stack be deployed in any hardware platform for future use beyond the projects? So again, um, Erica or Stasinos, perhaps, are the best, I think, position to answer the, que the question. Um, so the purpose of the project is not to provide a hardware platform. We have our course or inter internal clusters for internal use to run our to, to run the pilot cases on. Um, but all software is available in the GitHub. But we will not um, uh, foresee a hardware platform for external users. Thank you. So the next question I will answer myself. Uh, very simply. So the question is, will we make the slides available independently of the video, which, yes, will be on YouTube permanently? And if yes, where will the slides be? So we have a, flick, a slide share account. In the presentation there, you can also see the logo uh, on the screen on the top right. Um, if you go to our website, these uh, channels uh, sorry, <clears throat> will be um, visible there. And in the follow-up to the uh, webinar, we'll also include uh, blog posts on our website with a link to the slides on SlideShare. So I hope that uh, answers the question. Um, then the next question is the following. What are we expecting from the community? Partnering, testing, promoting the pilots? Um, I think I can also, uh, to a large extent, answer this question. So uh, we expect from the community um, at this stage, previously we were just uh, focusing on requirement elicitation. So uh, people from the different domains, uh, what are your challenges? What is your? What are the data assets in your domain? Uh, what are your difficulties? Uh, how would you like to um, uh, um, have big data technology in, in your system and infrastructures? And what, what is... Uh, uh, blocking uh, doing this, and um, we collected that information. Of course, uh, this is a continuous process, so more uh, requirements um, are always welcome. Um, if you didn't have the chance or opportunity, or if you just discovered about our projects uh, recently, please uh, don't um, think it's too late. We already always welcome this information. Um, Testing, uh, we'll have de demonstrations of uh, our technology. We'll have also the possibility uh, for some stakeholders to try hands-on our system before the end of the project, that's for sure. Um, and the promotion of the pilots uh, as well, yeah? So um, we would like the pilots to serve as an example for the different domains. So say for the transport domain. Um, if you're coming from the transport domain, um, you can see an example of how our uh, technology, our architecture and components have been uh, customized for a certain problem to achieve a certain result. And uh, the promotion of the pilots um, across the seven societal challenges has, has this purpose to uh, show that this is um, doable also for you or your institution. Um, if anyone else from the consortium today in the call has anything to add to my answer, Please um, jump in. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, this is Ronald. Uh, it, it, please don't hesitate um, at any time if you have any questions related to the current status of the pilots or how or about the evaluation or anything. Uh, just drop me a message. The email is in the slides and. Um, and I can, if I cannot answer it, uh, I can use the, the internal contacts to forward your question to. Thank you very much. So we go to the next question, and uh, that's to which requirements does an application need to comply to in order to be integrated in the BDE platform? So again, Stasinos or Erika, I think, can yes, answer. Um, to put it very simple, uh, if it can run in a Docker container, then it can run on our platform. Of course, if you want your component to be reused by the community, then it's best that you document it in a similar way as we do with our components um, uh, on the wiki. Um, and also that you make it a bit like uh, a base template for users so that they can easily extend it with their own uh, custom data or custom algorithm so that they can start using it 
with minimal effort. And if I may add uh, a few more words, uh, if you have a data problem, then most probably it can be formulated in a way that it fits uh, BDE. And so if your problem is that uh, you want to apply some operation over uh, large volumes of data or quickly changing data or uh, uh, data that needs uh, integration, then uh, most probably your problem can be formulated in a way that uh, BD can handle it. Okay, thank you for the answers. Uh, next question is the following. So, yes, uh, we deal with a lot of da different data formats uh, in the pilots, um, and some might be under license embargo, whereas others are not. Now, what are our plans to archive that data and also data that we have curated uh, to be able to run the pilots over them? And I think this was uh, specifically targeted at uh, you, Ronald. So, um, Yes. Um, currently, I have to admit that this is one thing um, that we didn't really f uh, look at at the moment. So the data that we are using um, is mostly uh, publicly available. And uh, the pilots that we are currently running is still uh, being uh, are going to be developed and tested is internal so therefore it is not yet an exposure to the outside community um, it is on the agenda to have a clear policy and guidelines on this matter so um, please have patience um, uh, it will be uh, it is taken on and um, there will be more information so thank you Thank you, Ronald. Okay, well, before we uh, answer the few questions remaining, um, please take the opportunity. You can see on the uh, slide on the screen here the contacts of the speakers today and the pictures. Sorry, I failed to introduce myself at the beginning. Uh, my name is Simon. I'm from the coordinator, coordinators uh, on behalf of the coordinator I'm presenting today. Okay, so uh, the next question is, uh, would you say that important research challenges in data handling still exist? Uh, to service the needs of the energy sector, or is it a matter of applying what you already know to a different use case? So um, here, um, someone from energy, I think we have Fragiscos on the line, perhaps, or someone else in the panel can uh, give an answer to this question. Uh, yes, uh, in, uh, uh, there are, uh, 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 for sure, my name is Fadis Ozmuzakis from CRES, okay, and uh, I work on the societal challenge of energy. Uh, uh, yes, uh, there is important research challenges in uh, data handling in, uh, uh, in the energy sector. Uh, sector. Uh, it is, this sector is uh, uh, heavily industrial and uh, uh, still new processes are under uh, development and uh, uh, new insights are, uh, we can get new insights from uh, analysis of, um, uh, of data that uh, are um, generated from the vast net network of, of sensors that uh, uh, control and, um, opt uh, and uh, so the systems can function um, in an optimized uh, way. Uh, so it is uh, combined. Uh, uh, there are uh, um, uh, the, the existence of um, a high volume of data along with uh, existing or other development uh, analytic uh, processes. So uh, what this BDE uh, can uh, deliver is um, the uh, knowledge so the community, not the, uh, uh, the high level uh, enterprises but also the middle level enterprises have uh, access to the uh, value of uh, uh, the existing and uh, existing uh, data, it must be noted that uh, currently the technology can um, we, are, we can afford to get uh, a lot of uh, data from um, our sensors at a very low cost. But still, we have questions about how to handle those those uh, uh, high volume um, amounts of uh, data. Thank you very much for this discussion. We're a bit over schedule, so let's go through the last three very quickly. How do we um, evaluate 
the generic uh, BDE technology if there is such a wide variety in pilots, each having their own requirements and context? I think, uh, Ronald, again. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, yes, the, the way we are going to do that is, um, I always call it uh, societal challenge zero, which is the, generic, the evaluation of the generic infrastructure. So there are some things that are uh, unified requirements, either functional or non-functional, independent of the, the pilot or the challenges uh, in general. Um, so you can say, how is the, um, the documentation? Uh, are we happy with the logging? Um, how easy is it to deploy uh, uh, things uh, on, on the BD of infrastructure? Um, that question uh, from uh, before, on licensing of, of data and maybe also algorithms might be um, not uh, under different license than an open source uh, license. So these are all uh, aspects that we are currently working on uh, on implementation and that will be part of this generic evaluation. And for the uh, seven challenges for each pilot, we will have pilot specific evaluation questions and there we take um, a, a, a non-prescriptive, so a descriptive approach where we just say, uh, ask the, uh, the, the, the participants, so that can be internal or external uh, testers of the platform and, and the pilot instances. Um, for example, uh, did, the, uh, did the technology work? So for example, we use uh, Cassandra or Spark um, to, to do analysis of this big data uh, um, store and, and make um, uh, summarized results. Did, that, did, did it work for you and was it, uh, was it on time? Uh, was the documentation good? So to, to, to summarize, we, we separated the generic questions that apply for the whole infrastructure with to the, um, and the uh, pilot specific questions and evaluation criteria. Thank you, Ronald. And uh, the next question, how does the platform differ from existing big data solutions such as Hortonworks, Cloudera, etc.? I think um, Erica, perhaps? Uh, yes, I will pause the word to my colleague, Art, who's sitting next to me. Uh, yeah, just hijacking the computer here then. Um, I think Hortonworks and uh, Cloudera have a, have a somewhat a different approach to solving problems. They're selecting a set of components which can be useful if, if they all use the right versions so that they can cooperate together, um, which is certainly a very valuable addition to the big data landscape. And it's something we can learn from and actually reuse, whereas the approach we take within the Big Data Europe platform is more geared towards how extensible a platform could actually be. So rather than saying these are the technologies you should use, we try to figure out these are the technologies you can use and we make it easy to integrate it with your own technology because you'll invariably have some custom um, data gathering or computational components of your own. So they're um, different in terms of um, target use, uh, but they can be integrated and can be in terms of versions we used. Thank you, Ed. And then we have a question. Will the pilots mentioned be available publicly? A very, very short answer is yes. Uh, perhaps Ronald can uh, very quickly elaborate a tiny bit? Um, yes, uh, the, the deliverables uh, within the in this project are mostly uh, public so uh, already by uh, by our agreement we have to make it open but yes everything will be uh, will be pl published when, when it is uh, digested and readable. Thank you. And the last question is, when will the technology stack be available for external deployment and what will be the terms of use? Um, so the public release, uh, the first public release is scheduled for August this year. But as I already said before, uh, our work in progress is already available on GitHub. So people can already uh, follow us if they want. And the terms of use, yeah, everything is open source, so you can use it uh, if you want. OK, thank you very much uh, to all presenters. Before uh, we conclude the webinar today, thanks a lot for your time. Thanks, and sorry for uh, using a bit more 
of the schedule time. Um, before you leave, I would like to remind you, you go to our website, you can um, follow our uh, contributions. Also, keeping in mind that today's webinar was uh, a societal challenge and independent, so it covered all domains because it's a technical nature. We'll have more of these. The next will be before the summer. But we'll have uh, other Hangouts and other webinars. And later on this year, we'll also have physical workshops related to the specific uh, domains. Yeah, So health, transport, food, uh, energy, and so on. Uh, but these, uh, sorry, today's webinar is independent of the domain. Um, we'll have more on these. Uh, keep an eye out on our website. You can find these slides, uh, slides later, as I said, on SlideShare. We have our uh, website, uh, Twitter page, LinkedIn. Um, and um, please get in touch with us um, if you want to uh, ask specific questions with our experts. Um, we also have a newsletter. If you become a stakeholder and register your interest in the project, you will receive uh, further information. So thank you again very much. And uh, we look forward to hosting a second technical webinar for the project.